Hi folks, so we're going to talk a little bit about the reactions to break up glycogen. Remember glycogen is our storage molecule for glucoses, uh, and those are directly taken out of the hexose monophosphate pool uh, in the form of glucose 1-phosphate. And the activities of the enzymes GDP glucose phosphorylase and gly uh, glu glycogen synthase are responsible for storing glucose 1-phosphates in this polymer form with alpha 1,4 linkages. You can see alpha 1,4. The alpha is because the tail and the linkage are on opposite sides of the molecule. This one's equatorial, that one's axial. And it's from the 1 position of 1 to the 4 position, 1, 2, 3, 4, of the next. And you can see these form nice little stacks um, and long chains. Of course, these can be branched using branching enzyme, etc. Um, but this is our predominant short-term storage solution uh, for glucose. So we can get a quick burst of energy if we need it by just breaking this thing down. And that happens through the activity of this, this uh, enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase. So this is a new kind of enzyme type um, we haven't talked about yet, uh, which is an enzyme that uses a free phosphate to break up a polymer. So the phosphate is actually what's doing the job. That's this guy right here. This is our free phosphate. Um, glycogen phosphorylase uses a new, also a new cofactor called pyridoxal phosphate, which is uh, here. It's bound to a lysine in the active site using, again, a shift base intermediate. And that keeps this thing bound covalently into the active site. And it's important that this is there because we want this phosphate always present. Um, and as you can see, the resonance forms here give this quite a bit of acidity on the phosphate, which it's going to need uh, to be able to do some transfers here. And uh, so... The way this mechanism is going to work is that this phosphate is going to attack the last one in the chain here, this last uh, glucose molecule in the glycogen chain, uh, and it's going to do some uh, proton transfers with the uh, pyridoxal phosphate. Now, I often will call pyridoxal phosphate, and you'll see it in the literature as PLP, pyridoxal phosphate. Uh, it's pyridoxal phosphate because it ha used to have an aldehyde up here, so pyridoxaldehyde. All right, so uh, with the next part of this reaction is going to be binding, of course, to our free phosphate and or glycogen. And it happens at glycogens that are at least six residues long, so six glucoses long. Uh, the enzyme phosphorylase is actually pretty large, and it needs the long stretches. Uh, if it doesn't have long stretches, then you have to use a debranching enzyme to move the branches so that you have a string of six or more. And that's really important when it comes to, uh, to control of glycogen breakdown. Okay, so I'm going to clear out my drawing here, and then we'll start with the mechanism. So again, um, what this enzyme has is a as a equilibrium uh, free energy around three kilojoules per mole. Um, that's you know that's standard free energies. So this is pretty. This is not too unfavorable. But because we have a lots of phosphate and a little bit of glucose one phosphate, um, then our free energy of the actual reaction is negative eight kilojoules per mole, which is favorable at physiological physiological condition, conditions. Um, so this is good. We want to be able to break it down whenever we need it. So um, what we need to start doing here is to start pushing some arrows to make this bond break. You can see there's a phosphate here on pyridoxal phosphate, and we have the nucleophilic phosphate from solution that we're going to use for the bond breakages. So the first thing we need to do is we need to do some disassociations of the last glucose in the chain. And luckily for us, we have this hydrogen around from phosphate. And so what we're going to do is we are going to protonate at that position. Um, and we're going to kick off the rest of the chain. Now, because we have this thing, uh, this phosphate around so close, we can actually do a glycoside hydrolysis and deprotonate the phosphate to give us an OH on the rest of the glycogen and a oxonium intermediate for the terminal end of glycogen. Now, of course, um, what we're going to do here is we just deprotonated, so we'll protonate from the pyridoxal phosphate, um, and we can... Sorry, i got to fix this. Oops. No negative charge on that thing. No yeah, negative charge. And we're going to deprotonate our pyridoxal phosphate, uh, and that will finish our reaction. We just need to give our bond electrons back to the oxygen. Whoa, undo that. Ah. Bond electrons, there we go. 
Okay, so we're going to give that back to our phosphate. So now we have now broken the glycogen into two pieces, the oxonium ion and the rest of glycogen. That is now one residue shorter than it used to be. That's the N minus 1 here in glycogen. So we started with one of N subunits, and now we are N minus 1. Uh, we haven't finished yet because we still don't have a glucose 1-phosphate. Um, so the next step we need to do is attach the phosphate to the glucose at the 1 position. That should be easy enough. So here is our oxonium ion. Our oxonium ion, as you remember, has a double bond to the oxygen to give oxygen a positive charge. Now, of course, oxygen is an electronegative element. It doesn't want a positive charge. And so we have to try to solve this problem uh, for oxygen. And the way we can do that is by attacking with our phosphate. Now, we're going to do this in reverse. Our PLP is going to deprotonate, and that bond is going to attack, and it's going to give our charge back to oxygen. Now it's key that it attacks here in the alpha configuration, so it comes in from the opposite side of the tail. We need to come in axial and equatorial, and that's because a lot of these enzymes tend to favor alpha glucose. And so we're going to have an alpha uh, phosphate glycoside um, of our glucose. We call that glucose 1-phosphate. So we've recharged our PLP, our glycogen can be released, and then we are going to have a glucose 1-phosphate. So as you can see, we've got our glucose 1-phosphate. It's alpha glucose 1-phosphate. We have our glycogen that's shorter by 1. We used to have 3 here, now it only has 2. And we have a recharged pyridoxal phosphate in glycogen phosphorylase active site. So that is the basic way that this me mechanism happens. So just to finish, a couple things we might want to talk about are how this thing is controlled. So the phosphorylase enzyme actually has two forms. It's a cooperative enzyme, and it has what you might call a T-form. Uh, T-form is inactive, uh, and it has an R-form, which is active. Uh, these two are obviously important for making sure that this enzyme works uh, as it needs to, and these can switch back and forth. Now, for any cooperative enzyme, you always want to start out in the less active form and switch into the active form so that you can turn on a pathway rather than turn it off. Uh, there's always going to be you know, pressure to keep it off. Um, it doesn't make much sense to always be invested in keeping, you know, keeping the enzyme turned off if you don't need it. And so, uh, things that can influence activity here is things that are going to influence uh, your energy levels. So remember what's going to happen here is we're going to be freeing up free, free uh, HMP members. Glucose 1-phosphate is part of the hexose monophosphate pool, and G G1P can become, of course, G6P and F6P in the hexose monophosphate pool and go into glycolysis. So anytime you're activating the phosphorylase, you're going to be driving uh, stuff into glycolysis. So that means you're going to need energy. Um, you can also pump it out of the cell if you have a liver enzyme, G6Pase, glucose 6-phosphatase. So you can either use this to fuel glycolysis if you're low on energy, or you can use it to feed the rest of the body through the liver, because um, li this, this enzyme, glucose 6-phosphatase, only is in the liver, um, if your blood sugar, for example, is low. And so what you're going to want here is low levels of energy, like AMP, are going to favor activity. And that should make sense, because if we have low levels of energy, we need to break up glycogen so that we can use these intermediates as part of our metabolism. The opposite is also true. ATP is going to repress it. If you have plenty of energy, there's no need for you to break down glycogen and make more. It just doesn't make much sense. And so what you can do with this thing is use basic energy readouts to turn this on and off. Now, of course, epinephrine can also favor the R state, and that's through a phosphorylation, through pKa which we'll talk about in a later video. But imagine that you're running from a bear or something, you need to get a quick burst of energy. quick way to do this is to access your glycogen storage, break down into the stuff you need for running from the bear, and the only way you can do that is by activating the R state.